And so a lot of pastors, you know, I love you and accept you and believe in you as long as you make our church look better. That's a treadmill that a lot of pastors burn out on. Mm. It's just, that's not sustainable. Ministry is up, ministry's down, and you have years of success and you have years of, you don't. To the pastors out there, you need to pull your youth pastor aside and you need to make sure that he or she knows that I believe in you and I have your back no matter what. Welcome to the Preaching Donkey Podcast, a weekly show where we explore how to preach life-changing messages. I'm your host, Lane Sebring, and I'm so excited to bring you inspiring and helpful conversations with amazing pastors and church leaders, all designed to help you take your preaching and leadership to the next level. And now, let's dive right in. What is up, everybody? Welcome to episode 12 of the Preaching Donkey podcast. I am Lane Sebring. I'm your host. Started Preaching Donkey back in 2014 to help preachers communicate better, and that's what we've been doing ever since. And today's episode of the Preaching Donkey podcast is going to be awesome. I'm interviewing Matt McClure. He's the youth pastor at First Baptist Church of Tulsa. Matt and I go way back. Uh, He's a very important person in my life and ministry, so I'll get more into that in just a second. I just want to say, if you're watching on YouTube, thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. Give this video a like. Let me know what you think in the comments. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Pandora or iHeartRadio or any of those other places, awesome to have you. Thanks so much for listening, and I would love for you to leave a review. It really helps. And share this podcast with a friend. That would be great. Today's interview is really kind of special to me because Matt McClure was the youth pastor at the church that I went to high school at, uh, First Baptist Church of Mustang, Oklahoma. I was there as a student in the youth group. It was a very large youth group, very exciting to be a part of it. And our youth pastor left, who had been there for a long time, and Matt McClure came at the beginning of my senior year in high school, right as we were just, I think, getting started the fall of our senior year in high school. And Matt and I just connected right away. And I went into ministry and Matt gave me a chance. He brought me on as an intern to work with him in the student ministry. And I actually worked there at the church for two and a half years uh, as a full-time, part-time, full, you know, year-round, but 20 hour a week intern and learned a ton, learned so much about ministry, learned how to uh, organize and run and lead a student ministry in a large church, which ended up being invaluable to me as I went on after college to be a youth pastor at a church in the DC area for several years. Uh, I learned how to handle the hardships in ministry. I learned how to lead. I learned how to lead with integrity. I learned how to make sure that what we were doing was fun, but also safe, um, that it was relevant, but also uh, helpful and biblical and spiritual. I just learned a ton from Matt. And so to be able to have him share the perspective of what it's like to be a student pastor and try to connect with students and preach and teach to students and teenagers. And then also for a lot of people who might be listening, who are lead pastors, how to relate to your student pastor. He's got some really great insights on that. And I know a lot of people listen who are student pastors, and I think you're going to really glean from his experience of having been in student ministry for a long time and having a lot of experience in some really great churches. So Matt moved from First Baptist Mustang to First Baptist Tulsa when I was a junior in college. And so for that summer, I was the interim student pastor at that church, and I learned a ton through that experience. Uh, That was an interesting summer, but it was great. It was fun. And then I moved on to a different church for my senior year uh, and interned and then ended up moving to the D.C. area, as I said. So when Matt moved to Tulsa, we stayed in touch for what at this point is like a decade and a half, uh, which is pretty awesome. And we, we talk often and uh, he's, a, he's a great friend. And so this conversation is one that I'm very excited to share with you. Matt is a genuine leader. He's a genuine servant of the Lord. And he is a genuine family man and pastor. And so I think you're really going to love the interview here with Matt McClure. So let's get right to it. 
Matt McClure, thanks so much for being on today. Thank you, Lane, for letting me be a part of this. Man, I'm honored. Yeah, it's great to have you. So I've talked a little bit about you and our friendship together and how we've known each other for so many years. But could you tell, for those of us who are listening, a little bit about your journey getting from where you started, uh, being called to ministry, to where you are today as the student pastor at First Baptist Tulsa? Yeah, so uh, I'm from Oklahoma, and um, I'm currently the youth pastor of First Baptist Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I've been here for uh, over 14 years as the youth pastor. I uh, grew up in southeastern Oklahoma. My dad um, is a full-time farmer and rancher, so I grew up in the country. Ended up going to Oklahoma State to major in ag, and while I was there, um, was involved in the local church and volunteered in the youth ministry, um, and then ended up being paid to kind of fill in while they're in between youth pastors, and God just really used that moment to show me that that was the career path for me that God had placed upon my heart was to do full-time ministry. And so uh, started serving as soon as I graduated from Oklahoma State uh, at a local church in the Tulsa area, um, and ended up going from there to Dallas, and then from Dallas to a little town in um, Oklahoma City called Mustang. And I met this guy named Lane Sebring while I was a youth pastor at First Baptist Church in Mustang. And um, so from there, Lane, you know, I was there for three and a half years and then came to First Baptist Church, Tulsa. Um, but that's kind of been my, my career path. And, um, you know, God has just still put a lot of passion for me for student ministry and working with teenagers. And so still love it. And I've done it long enough now, Lane, that my own daughter is in my youth group which wow. is crazy. That's really cool. That's very rewarding. You know, uh, so I talked a little bit about this before we jumped on, but we met because when I was going into my senior year in high school, you were coming on as the youth pastor at the church that I went to in Mustang. And uh, that was, I, I feel like that was a divine appointment. I feel like, um, obviously God called you to that church, but I feel like in terms of just in my life, uh, we hit it off and then you ended up bringing me on as an intern, took a risk. I mean, I, if I remember right, uh, I became an intern at that church one semester into my freshman year in college. And you even had people telling you, he's too young, don't take a chance. This is Yeah, I had work. a key volunteer who uh, basically sat me down and said, do not do this. And, and I said, no, no, um, we're going to bring Lane on. And I need Lane. And I see value in having him. And, and not because of you, but just because that was too young, that was too early to bring anybody on board as an intern. But um, Lane, I quickly saw your, your potential to do ministry, you know, when you were in high school and we hit it off when I first got there because you can't play basketball with a lick and neither can I. So that was our first thing that we bonded <laughs> over. I mean, we were just fast friends like, Oh, you're not an athlete either. Sounds great. Right. <laughs> Well, it just goes to show, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes when, when you know the move as a leader, even if you've got people that are pressuring you, sometimes you just got to make the call. And I am biased, but I think you made the right one <laughs> because, you know, I can look back and see where uh, the two and a half years that I worked there with you, I learned a ton about ministry, not just student ministry, but I learned about ministry. I learned how to do ministry with integrity and to have proper boundaries, and to lead well, and to lead big, to lead with vision. And I learned how to have fun. That's one of the things yeah. that you taught me. It, and if you're not enjoying doing what you're doing, then you're not going to be very good at it. And that's the one thing I can say about the time that you were an intern, and, and many interns I've had since then, is, is this enjoying doing ministry together. And yeah. if, if you can't, it's, it's, it's not worth it. So, so in 2006, right? That's when you left Mustang? Yes. So yep. you've, been, you've been at First Baptist Tulsa now for 14 years. And right. um, in that time there, obviously you've done more than speaking to students. You're running an entire student ministry and doing a lot of other things. But one of the big parts of your job is to speak to students. And so I want to know, because I've got a lot of people listening who may not be student pastors, but who are lead pastors, some of them are student pastors, but I've got associate pastors and college ministers and different things, but everybody wants to talk to the next generation. Everybody who has any shred of just wants to remain relevant 
has a desire to reach people who are younger because if we lose them, then we've lost, we've lost it all. We've lost the next generation. So what would you say that you've discovered over these, these decades in student ministry and, uh, and speaking to students about how to reach them? Well, certainly when, when speaking to students, um, it is just so very important to engage them when you sit down and you have either a small group Bible study with them or you are teaching from the platform um, to be able to engage them. Um, and there's so many, so many similarities between if I'm teaching five students or I'm teaching, um, you know, I had an opportunity to speak at Oklahoma's um, statewide camp um, in the mornings and we had, I don't know, 3,000, 4,000 teenagers in the room at the same time. And the principle I was shocked was really the same is engaging the students um, and understanding the, you know, how, how to speak to teenagers. So, you know, I would encourage anybody who is taking time to speak to students that you need to find uh, ways to engage them. Students um, are going to listen to the key principles that you have um, when they're listening. And I think it's very simple for pastors or for anybody to be teaching, to think I'm teaching great content and you might be, but is anybody listening to it? Um, and so, um, I mean, that's a key, that's a key detail for any time I'm teaching students is I want them to walk away. And you know, this, this is not spiritual at all lane, but in my mind, I like to think of when I'm done teaching, when a student gets in the car and they're driving home and the parent says, what did you learn today? Like what they repeat is a key factor in how well I did. Not if some student comes up to me and says, that was the best sermon or that was the best lesson. That, I mean, that doesn't say a whole lot. But when the parents come back to me and say, hey, I was talking to little Johnny and he talked about how you talked about how in family we should be, you know, um, or this is the key verse that, we, that you talked about today, or this is the key point that they're able to repeat that back. That means I did my job that I did a great job in communicating that spiritual principle to that student. Um, so what are some ways that you can make sure that those principles get across? So you talk about engaging, right? And they have to be listening. So what are some of the things that you do to make sure that they are listening? Um, what are some of the things I do to make sure that they're listening? Yeah. One way, one thing that I do is we of course use lots of illustrations in teaching students. Humor is a great, factor in engaging students. Now, I will tell you a diminishing product of mine in teaching teenagers is the ability to be funny. Like it was easy for me in my 20s and 30s, but now that I'm in my 40s, like what's funny to me gets crickets from the crowd. <laughs> so, but I, I've also learned that's not, I mean, that's important and I tell lots of stories and students listen um, but humor and, and, and illustrations are important. But the other thing that I think is key that I use a lot of is um, object lessons. So whether, um, even though we use lots of screens and we have the, the, everything that's up on the screens, you know, through the PowerPoint, you know, presentations that we're using, even this last weekend, we did a retreat. Um, I used a whiteboard, you know, we talked about how, you know, how, students categorize themselves as good Christians or bad Christians. So we wrote that up on the board and how God doesn't put us in those categories. Um, but to make it clear to students, you know, we use that. So I've got the whiteboard out old school style. And the one thing I noticed, as soon as I started writing on the whiteboard, I had their attention. Like, what am I writing? Um, you know, I use lots of illustrations, especially if I'm doing evangelistical messages, I'll try to use an illustration to, to demonstrate what I'm trying to talk about. And when I do that, students really key in, especially when we do camps. A lot of times the lesson that I'll do at camp will just be the object lesson itself. Students are already kind of mentally burned or tired as you get throughout the week. And the object lesson on itself really stands as the lesson. The last thing I do when I communicate is I, I will, basically I need a one word sentence that describes my message. Like what's the point I want them to know? Um, and so uh, several weeks ago, we did a lesson. The, the key, phrase was, key, key phrase was, Jesus loves me no matter what. I start with that line, Jesus loves you no matter what. And I end it with that line, Jesus loves you no matter what. And so when I, cause, because when I want a kid in the car going home, they said, little Johnny, what did you talk about today? I want him to say, Jesus loves me no matter what. 
I'm like that's the phrase I want to get in their drill in their brain. And so I'll use that one word sentence all throughout my talk. Yeah, that's really, that's an effective strategy. And I, I think, you know, that works not just for teenagers because teenagers happen to be people <laughs> as well, right? Right, right? So we grow up and little Johnny turns into big Johnny and they still can't remember 17 points, but they can remember one phrase or one bottom line. Yeah, and how many times have we walked away from any any talk? We've, we've sat and we've like, now what was the point again, right? Like, I'm not sure what the point was. That's even more so amplified with teenagers, even if you think you've made it clear that they didn't catch it. Can you think of some of the more common visual, visual illustrations or object lessons that you've done? One or two examples that just come to mind and what you illustrated with them. Okay, so um, this one has differing opinions on the passage used, and, and I'll say that up front. Um, but in Revelation chapter three, um, Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Anyone who enters it, I will come in and dine with him. Now, uh, I was using that passage in just saying, hey, Jesus is knocking on your heart's door. Now, Jesus is talking to John, and he's talking about the church and him coming and dining with the church. And I, I've gotten some pushback on that verse that's taken out of context. I would argue that's not. So I'm just going to put that up front. So I use an object lesson with a door. We went to Home Depot, we bought a door, I put it in a frame, we brought it out, and I bought the cheapest door they had, Lane. And, um, and so we had the door, and I turned, and I was knocking on the door. And I'm trying to make the point that Jesus is talking to you this week, okay? This is the fr last night of camp, Jesus is talking to you this week, and many of you need to respond, because we, you know, we had students resisting, making decisions, you need to respond, so I'm knocking on the door, and my whole object lesson was to knock, knock a little louder, knock a little louder and then open the door because it was in a frame and it had legs so you could actually open and close the door and because i had bought such a cheap cheap door when i did the loudest knocking i put my fist through the door <laughs> <laughs> and when i did that there was an audible gasp in the audience like <gasps> like when i put my fist through the door because i mean i was knocking pretty loud but i mean this thing was made of paper i mean it was the, it was i mean it didn't take much for me to put my but it looked like a hulk hogan like bam right, right through the door and i just kept going and i opened the door and i said and now jesus now let jesus come in i'm just telling you Kids responded, like even today that students who by now have graduated and gone on to college would say, what was the most memorable lesson Matt's ever done? They said the time he knocked on the door, like that was a big deal. Uh, another one would be like using a trap. And I, I got some traps from my dad's farm, the big bear, like, like, like coyote traps. Talk about how sin is a trap. And I would take a stick and just be kind of unlike, you know, we're just playing with fire. Like, I want to do this over here. And then I hit the trap and the trap snaps. And that just creates this like, oh, man, that in, in talking about the pain that sin causes. Another one would be using a plexiglass. It's not plexiglass, but it's the, the, the safety glass that you put in a car, um, like windshield. It's got the, the, the I don't know, the, the stuff in between the two pieces of glass. So it's shatterproof. And, and talking about how we allow God, what well, we allow the enemy, Satan himself, you know, uh, we experiment with sin on our lives. It's like taking a hammer to this glass. And then I'll take a hammer and I'll be hitting the glass. Like it's not bothering me. And if you hit that glass just hard enough, it, it shatters within the glass. You're not breaking the glass and shattering people, but you are shattering the glass and it makes a really cool splatter effect. And then talk about how this is what you look like. Like if I hold this up to me, this is what my life looks like. And then I have another one. Then I put it down and I say, but when we ask Christ in our life, he makes us, puts us back together. So, you know, here's a piece of clean glass. Um, so those are a lot of different ones that I've used throughout the years that just to make. And those are some of my more camp visuals that I've done. Um, but even for a Wednesday, say like a, a midweek or Sunday morning, I'll still use visuals of, of any way that I can to help get a point across. Yeah, I, I love that. I, I think there's something about just, I would imagine when you do this, and I've experienced this as well when I've used visual illustrations, 
everybody's watching. Like everybody wants to see what happens with the thing that you're messing with. Yep. Yeah. 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 I mean, they could be half asleep and be like, Oh, what, what's about to happen here? Um, that, that they really key in with that. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, so let's talk about, um, when it comes to your, uh, student ministry leadership and developing talks and all that kind of stuff. You've got a lot going on, right? In, in a student ministry, like I said, yep. uh, for those who haven't led a student ministry effectively, because I did it for seven years, plus the, the time that I was an intern, you're effectively leading a, a church within a church, right? You've got worship yes. services, small groups, missions, <laughs> outreach. I mean, you're doing everything, but you don't have the staff of a large church. So there's a whole lot that is on you as the student pastor. So what are some challenges within that that you faced and how have you overcame them and what could you share that would be helpful to those listening? Well, um, you know, when I, me- I remember when I first started and guys were like, yeah, we write our own Sunday morning curriculum. And you're like, oh, that's so cool. I wish I could write my own Sunday morning curriculum. And then you start writing curriculum. And you're like, why am I writing curriculum? <laughs> you're like, because literally that's a job within itself. Um, and, um, or, or, you know, you're, you're planning a missions program or you're planning camp. So really, I think, um, there are not enough hours in the week to do everything that you want to do and to do it the way you would like to see it done. So I think you have to step back as a youth pastor or, you know, in, in, in any ministry capacity and you got to maximize your time. Um, and every church is very different. So I know when we were at Mustang, we wrote our Wednesday night curriculum. And we, we strategized and we planned that. We had Sunday morning curriculum that we bought. Um, but my administrative duties as a youth pastor there were nothing like what I have at First Baptist Tulsa. Like I, my, my administrative requirements here are way more intense just by the way the church is designed. And so everyone's very different. So I don't have time to write everything. Um, so for years we wrote our own own curriculum for our midweek. Um, and because we're just in a point of time right now that we are, don't have time to do that. We've actually bought curriculum that we're using on Wednesday nights. Um, it comes already with everything we need. I can go and I can edit, change, use it how I want. Um, and, um, but I, I'm not, I'm not locked down to do all the fine details for our midweek small groups. And uh, or our Sunday morning, our Sunday morning small groups and our midweek large group. Um, and I have freed up that space because currently in this season uh, that we're all in of uh, coming back from COVID, um, my time is spent on the phone following up with students. You know, I, we're working hard to minister to families and do one on one ministry. And I don't have time to be writing curriculum all week long. So I've I have created created space for myself by purchasing curriculum. And, and there's no shame in that whatsoever. And I would prefer to write it. I enjoy it. I don't have time for it. Another would be like our, our, our mission trip. So years ago, we did our own mission trip, planned it, did all the coordination, went early, came back, get everything prepared. And then I came across an organization that did all that for you. Now we paid a little extra for them to coordinate and plan, but it was a fantastic trip. And so that just saved me hours of my time in prepping and planning a mission trip by being able to just use a company who did that for me. And so we, we easily did that. So I, anything you do, I think if you can find a way to really save yourself time, um, because honestly, there are things that we, we would do that we would spend our entire week doing that one thing, but you don't have a week to do that one thing. You have 10 other things you've got to do as well. So you've got to find ways to help save your time to really focus in on things that are important, which for me at this moment is one-on-one ministry to families and students who have yet to come back from, from this whole COVID experience. What would you say, I want to shift gears real quick. What would you say to lead pastors or senior pastors who aren't used to speaking to students, but go into their student ministry, maybe their youth pastor has the night off or whatever, and they go in and they're going to speak to the students what are some things that you would tell them that they need to be aware of when they're communicating with student, students? Yeah. So the, I would just say you need to make sure you know your audience, know who your audience is when you're speaking to your audience. And I think for pastors who are going to go speak to the youth on a Wednesday night or um, 
or go be the speaker at their church's camp or whatever it might be, um, you can't speak to them like you would, you know, a Sunday morning crowd. Now, a lot of them do, and they don't change their technique or their format, but you need to understand that you're speaking to students and you need, you need to speak to your audience. I, I'll give a perfect example. Years ago, um, uh, a lead pastor I worked with was the speaker at camp and um, man, and he, he just did not understand who his audience was in speaking with students. And he just still delivered a message as if he was speaking to our main, our main church. And he was a complete flop. And, and in, in reviewing back to that, I mean, here you have a, a main pastor who's like, I just don't think I can speak to teenagers. And my response was anybody can speak to teenagers. Just know you're not speaking to adults. Um, and uh, simplify that message a little bit. Go back to that one word phrase if you need to. Um, but that's what you need to make sure you understand. So I would imagine the same would apply for the lead pastor who knows that there are teenagers in the main room when they're speaking to the Sunday morning service. They, they don't want to just aim at adults. So how, how would you uh, advise a lead pastor, senior pastor, who knows that there are students in there and wants them to be attentive and wants them to want to be there? Um, is it some of the same principles? I mean, how would you, how would you approach that? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I would think so. And um, I mean, if I was the lead pastor of a church, I think one of the things I would want to do is I would want to get feedback as I go. You want to get feedback from your senior adults. You're going to get feedback from your main adults. You want to get feedback from your student ministry crowd. And, um, and if your feedback, you're, you're seeing that you're not, they're not understanding or perceiving what you're trying to talk about, then you may need to make some efforts to change that message to better hit that target audience uh, each and every Sunday. And I know that's kind of shotgun approach, but certainly if you're speaking and preaching every week and your students have tuned you out, you're reaching an entire segment of your audience that you, you need to, you need to reach. Um, yeah. So I, I would just, cause I don't think pastors really even try to get a lot of feedback. Like they just kind of hinge on those couple like attaboys and then they think they're good to go. Um, but, and, and I was just, one thing that I do Lane, and I know you encourage this, but you know, get that video and watch yourself and watch it and think as a, this age group person, am I, you know, thinking with those terms as you watch um, is super helpful. Cause then you're like, man, that was, that was the worst message I ever gave <laughs> when I thought it was great when I gave it. Yeah, no, I, I think watch, yeah, watching your game film is, is huge. And, and you know what you said about feedback, I think the problem with a lot of feedback is that positive feedback tends to be very general, right? Hey, great yeah. sermon. Doesn't mean yeah. anything. It's, it, it's encouraging. Negative feedback tends to be very specific, but it doesn't tend to be delivered to you. <laughs> it tends to right. be delivered about you behind your back. So right. most of the yeah, that's unsolicited is, is just kind of generally good, makes us feel good, doesn't do anything for us. So I think you're very wise to suggest that the pastors actually seek out real feedback, watch their game film, and ask themselves the tough questions. I, I think that's really good. Yeah, Lane, when I worked in Texas, uh, one of the things we did um, every Monday in staff meeting is we would kind of do a replay of Sunday, and the staff would sit around and and give critical views of the pastor's sermon from the Sunday before. And he had, you know, he didn't hurt him a bit. And like how, and, and from the worship ministry through the, you know, the Sunday, like how did it go? And we would all give feedback and he would write those down. And that was so, I, I love that. So we try to do that here with my staff and my team. We talked through, you know, any of our event, we try to replay, go back over it. What could we do better? What wasn't good? Um, cause I want to hear from them and I want to give them that space to be critical of what I'm doing and put my big boy pants on and know that I can be better if it was bad. Um, but not a lot of pastors give that space to do that. And, and I, that, I think that's, you, you know, if you want to give critical feedback, then create a group that you can get it from. Don't just kind of stand around and wait for someone to criticize you and think, Oh, okay, I need to improve on that. You know, and, and if you've got a staff you can do that with, that would be awesome. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. My, my church that I'm a part of right now, we, we have a, every, every Wednesday, whoever's preaching that day preaches the message that's coming up on Sunday. So we do what you're, what you're saying just kind of in advance, but we preach the message and then, and then sit down and everybody gives feedback on the message. This wasn't very clear. I don't know what you meant by this. I think this would be better. And it makes Sunday better because there's been, and, and particularly our student guys will, will raise their hand and say, you didn't say one thing about anybody in high school or middle school. You never engaged them. You never gave an example that related to them. Um, or they'll say, hey, when you gave this example that's going to relate to my middle schoolers, that makes me feel good because I know they're going to be paying attention. So yep. I, I think in both cases, your pastor in Texas um, and in our situation here, the lead pastor has to be willing to allow feedback from their staff, which is very uncommon. Uh, for a lot of churches, I have found that the, 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 the sermon especially is like this is like sacred ground. And I think a lot of that's motivated by insecurity from the pastor and also a feeling of these people work for me. I don't want them telling me what to do. So it really takes a lot of, of humility. But if you can lead that kind of culture, whether in a student ministry or as the lead pastor, then it trickles down into every single part of your staff and everybody knows that you have a culture of evaluation and you're always working to improve. Yeah, and so and it's, it's called being able to take constructive criticism and it doesn't just work in, I mean, so speaking to the people listening, people who criticize, you know, who give a critical thought, a critical idea about your ministry or your, you know, having the wherewithal to listen to that and not put an emotional attachment to it. Like, Oh, I'm so, you know, how dare you, you know, it's easy for us to go straight there and to listen to that because not always, it's not always all true, but in what they share, what is true, what, you know, what, what, what is, what is truth about what they just told me? Oh, I, I can't improve on that because there is something we can always improve on. And I think that's really helpful, especially when you have parents as a youth pastor who will be critical about something you've done to listen to that and go, okay, well, there might be a hint of truth in that that I need to apply to my life. And I always respond with it. Thank you so much. I appreciate that as we always try to make our ministry better, you know, and then maybe I'll go find something to punch later if it makes me angry, but I try not to respond that way. I think as a speaker, you got to do the same thing um, in listening critically and allow people to give you critical, uh, constructive criticism of what you do. Yeah, I absolutely. I want to ask one more question that I feel like I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you. Um, and then I want to talk about how you responded to the pandemic. Okay, so here, here's my question before we talk about the pandemic. What would you say to lead pastors or senior pastors who are listening? Who, what would you say to them that they need to understand about their youth pastor and the, and the world that their youth pastor lives in? Um, I would say... Um, first and foremost, it is very important to youth pastors that they live in a world where they, they know that their, their pastor that they work for believes in them and trusts them and, and has their back. Um, so I, th I know that in a lot of staff cultures, um, pastors will portray this this view that I have your back as long as you are being successful. And, um, you know, I know you're about to ask me about the pandemic, but there's a lot of youth pastors who are freaking out because their metrics for success have been totally taken off the table. And, um, and so a lot of pastors, you know, I love you and accept you and believe in you as long as you make our church look better. And that's a treadmill that a lot of pastors burn out on. Mm. It's just, that's not sustainable. Uh, ministry is up, ministry's down, and you have years of success, and you have years of you don't, you know, and it's just, it's like running in mud. Um, and uh, so, to the pastors out there, you need to pull your youth pastor aside, and you need to make sure that he or she knows that I believe in you, and I have your back no matter what. And even if you have a youth pastor, you're like, this guy needs to move, or this lady needs to move to somewhere else, like, this is not working out. If that can be done in a way like, I believe in you, I want to help you in your career be better. Even if that's not here, you can make help make that transition so much better and invest in the life of, of a family. Um, and, you know, because for the youth pastor, it is their career that they're trying to do. 
Um, so yeah, so first and foremost, uh, for youth pastors to know that they operate under this umbrella of safety. Um, like my, my, my pastor believes in me. And when a youth pastor is able to do ministry, you know, with that worry off the table, I think as a pastor, you'll be surprised how much better of a quality ministry you're going to get from your youth pastor. When, when he knows that I'm no longer under this like strain of meeting these metrics uh, of my job, um, that some of those things are not even under their control. Yeah, so that's, that's really, what I want to know. Yeah, that's really good. I, that I, 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 I've experienced, I've experienced both sides of that, and, and I will say that I, I completely, completely agree how, how vital that is. So you talked a little bit about the metrics for success changing due to the, the world that we're in right now. What are some things that you have done differently as a result of COVID? Um, what are you looking to for the future? Just like to kind of get into a little bit of that as we're wrapping this up. Yeah. So uh, it's interesting that we're doing this today because actually my pastor was in my office today having a, a conversation about our future of the student ministry based on our numbers. And um, so uh, because we're at a larger church, um, you know, we, we're, we're not just bound to ministerial staff making choices. We have, we have committees, we have, you know, uh, key people uh, that are helping pull the strings of ministry financially and all those, all those things. And all of us are working together to help change what the metrics are. So they, if you ask any church, metrics of success are active attenders, baptisms, um, you know, uh, decisions that you have made each year. Um, how many do you have averaging on um, your key night with it for many churches, Wednesday night or Sunday morning? Um, COVID has completely, completely taken all that out of play. Um, obviously, we shut down with everybody else uh, in March of 2020. We came back online in June of 2020. Um, and right now during this podcast lane, we're running maybe 60 to 75% of what we ran before. That's good. So Those are good very, numbers, it's, man. It's very good. And, and, and I'm not tooting my horn in any, in any way, but you know, church wide, we're still only running about 35 to 40% attending in person. Now we do have a lot still doing the, the, um, watching remotely, but for us, zoom is dead. We just cannot get anybody, any teenagers on Zoom. No one wants to be on Zoom. Yeah. Um, and so we have 35 to 40% of our ministry that have just totally vanished. Um, and, you know, when you have a kid who came once a month and then COVID hit, and we've not seen that kid or his family since. Um, so what we have kind of shifted into that we really haven't done before is really working hard to go after individual families, creating space for us to be able to make the list of the people that we need to go after. Like who, cause we don't want a family to feel like, well, they just, I was forgotten about. Um, and no one's been forgotten ab about, but we, you know, we really depended upon that every, every now and then touch point that attenders would give you. So you got a kid who's, um, they come, 25% of the time throughout the year. Well, that's, you know, you're touching base with a kid once a month, once every two months. And, and then you would do a follow-up and you, depending on your volunteers to follow up, but when they're just never here and it even goes with volunteers. I mean, we're on like volunteer life support in our middle school ministry alone. Uh, we've gone from uh, we we're only running 20% of the manpower that we had before. Um, and that's because we have families who just no longer are attending. Um, and so as we kind of come out of COVID, the questions are, why are they not coming back? And I, I think this is a larger church question than it is for our podcast here. Sure. But I think the reality is, is that once you get out of the habit of being a part of, you know, community, it's hard to come back. And, and COVID has really, um, made that, uh, apparent that when we come out of COVID, those families are just going to magically reappear. And so the work that we're having to do as a staff to go after those families, I think that's the new metric. That's the new metric of success is going after those families, those students and those 
um, people who have disconnected and trying to get them connected back in um, as much as we can and finding new and creative ways to be able to help them plug in if they're not going to be here in person. I don't, I don't have answers on what those new and creative ways are, but just setting back and waiting for people to show back up is not going to work. And if, especially if your pastor's like, Hey, you should be running these many numbers or you should be baptizing these many people. Uh, we just know that's not going to happen because those people aren't here. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's, that's really good. You know, it's, it's funny because even if COVID's not happening, sometimes what youth pastors face is uh, a, a lead pastor who sometimes expects more from the student ministry than the church is delivering. So the, the student ministry better be growing. The church hasn't grown in a decade, <laughs> you know? Um, right. So, uh, so, so there's, there's, there's challenges all over the place, but COVID has definitely changed things. And I think you're right that the, the metric is going to be engagement. It's going to be going after the people who have been, have been disengaged, caring for them, showing mm-hmm. that. Cause I think some people, like you said, they get out of the habit and there are, there are a certain amount of people who, who will not re-engage without a personal invitation. They Correct. Just, but, but with a personal invitation, they will re-engage. Um, but that just t- takes a lot of phone calls and a lot of frustration and, and a lot of work. So, um, you know, we, we had a family, um, I'm going to say four years ago, we had a family that was involved here in our church and they, they unengaged. And, and let us know, let us know, they were engaged in our student ministry, so we are leaving the church for X number of reasons, and we're going to go somewhere else, and kind of, kind of, you know, kind of, after, and so, hey, uh, uh, they just, hey Matt, you, you froze up when you said they left for X number of reasons, Can I am pick so it up sorry, no, it's fine, let me try that one more, <laughs> it might be, so, my, it might be my internet that's slow, yeah, um, but we had a we had a family that left our church several years ago and kind of closed the door being here. And we just found out this last week had a family tragedy. And and, and sadly, the, the dad of this family um, has passed away. Hmm. And the word got back to us that after they left, no one from our church ever followed back up. Now, they were involved in my ministry specifically. And there was a number of reasons why they felt like they needed to go somewhere else. But it was like, but they kind of said, hey, we're we're done and we're moving on but they never moved on to anywhere and then felt hurt that we never followed back up. I think that just, just is a, just a solid reminder that people, people are waiting to hear from us, right? Like I'm leaving, don't call me, but you call them. They're like, thank you so much. Cause they, they need that spiritual connection and engagement from their minister. Um, and I think it's easy for us as be like, well, they're not happy here and I don't want to bug them and I don't want to, I don't want to bother them, but they want to be bothered. And so um, for my staff here, we've literally made now a Google sheet that we are adding all the families on that we need to follow up with. These are all the people we haven't heard from that we haven't seen. And we're making an active um, job of calling all those families. And I'm going to take the next several months to make sure we follow up with all of them because we don't know why they haven't come back. And we need to answer the question, why aren't they here? Um, so that, that is the job we've kind of put in front of ourselves here, uh, just recently. Well, that's awesome, Matt. You, you, you're doing a lot of great ministry and I appreciate the time that you've taken out to speak with me and to speak to the preaching donkey audience here. I know a lot of people are going to benefit from this. So thanks so much for being on today. Awesome. Awesome. And to all your listeners, man, just, uh, we're all in this together and praying for each of them and, and thank you Lane for what you're doing. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. So I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I did. Matt McClure is a very special friend to me, very special mentor in my life. It was just awesome to sit down with him and hear his wisdom and his insight related to how to connect with the next generation and how to how to manage and lead uh, through the situation that we're in right now in, in 2020 and 2021 and all that's happening in the world. So Hope you enjoyed that. Be sure to leave a comment below if you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening over on any one of the podcast players, you can email me, lane at preachingdonkey.com. I'd love to hear from you. I want to put something free in your hands. If you're listening to this or watching this 
and you want to go further with your sermon prep and sermon delivery, I have just the thing for you. If you go to preachingdonkey.com slash 21 days, you can grab my free 21 day guide to creating killer sermons. It's a three week, three step process that will walk you through just a simple process of studying the text, creating an outline and making a compelling message. So if you haven't got that yet, it's a free gift just for you. Preachingdonkey.com slash 21 days. That's it for our show today. I'll see you next week here on the Preaching Donkey podcast. And remember until then, if God can speak through a donkey, he can speak through you and he can speak through me. 